On the quiz, I'll give you two problems. One of them is going to be rectilinear, and one of them is probably going to be polar slash cylindrical. So this is the canonical rectilinear one. I said if we're going to go through this one pretty slowly today, uh, but after you, we do this, cylindrical is going to be quite easy, at least in this direction. There's one cylindrical direction that's a little bit confusing that's in the azimuthal direction that doesn't look at all like a parabola. Um, we'll have to spend time on that uh, probably Monday morning, Monday. So imagine you're like an ant in the middle of a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, like, or maybe not even ant, like a bacteria. Then the bread is infinite in the x direction and the z direction, but the bread is a finite width apart. Um, is that the direction y? So conservation of mass tells us there's a relationship between the velocities. So in general, u is, is really complex. u is a function of, um, in general, u has three directions. Uh, for rectilinear coordinates, it's uh, an x, y, and z direction, which we call u, v, and w. And each of these, Each of these are a function of x, y, z, and t. Ultimately, that's why the Navier-Stokes equations like have so many terms um, and are very difficult to solve. Because you've got three directions, each direction is a function of four variables. That's like three times four. That's like twelve different potential, twelve different little like you know derivatives and things like that you see here. But all the cases that we're going to solve this is going to become uh, something very simple. In this case, it'll be u of y x hat. So the velocity vector in this case is all in the x direction. And instead of being a function of all the you know, positions in space, it's only a function of the distance between the plates. You need to get to, a, basically, you go from multivariable, multi, multivariable, multifunction to single variable, single function. And that's the key thing in all these Navier-Stokes problems for the quiz. Um, and that variable is usually the one that's finite, because uh, as stuff varies in infinite directions, you can't really have any derivatives that are not zero. So, I mean, if you were on the quiz, you didn't have time, you could just write this, and you'd maybe get one point wrong. If you want to get, you know, 10 out of 10, you've got to show, based on, you know, the fact that of infinite plates, that this is just a function. And that comes out of going through the governing equations. One of them is conservation of mass, which um, is on the sheet. It looks like this. Um, we've already said that uh, we already have one assumption that the particles move uh, in the x direction only. If particles move in the x direction, that means v is equal to w is equal to 0, and these were going away. And that means u does not change with x. That's what that says. When we say derivative of u respect to x is 0, it means u does not change with x. Um, that means whatever profile we create is valid for any, any point x. Um, so basically saying the particles move in the x direction only, is equivalent to, um, to, to, saying, to saying this. Because u is no longer a function of x. Um, and, u, and u is basically in, in the z direction. It's infinite. So basically, u can't vary in that direction either. So the only variable left is u changing as a function of y. All right, so that's where we were last time. Um, uh, a few more. So we've already defined u as a function of u here. Uh, for this particular problem, um, let's call G. So we'll have the peanut butter. Um, you can, we can do various ways. I think there are various. All the homeworks are slightly different combinations of either the boundary condition or gravity. Your gravity is going to go in the y direction. So we'll say G is um, negative G y hat. OK, going down that way. Um, I think the problem with statement, they said it was steady. So any d by dt terms um, are going to be 0. 
And with, the, with basically this simplification here, and with the v equals w equals zero here, if you look at your sheets, you have very, very few terms that are remaining. Um, why don't you try to, so the next step is basically, you're gonna look at your sheet, and you're gonna write the x, y, and z um, linear momentum equations, and we're gonna solve for them. We're, we're actually gonna integrate and solve for them. So I would, I would say if you've got your sheet, if you don't have it, try to look at a neighbor's, and cross, you can either cross it out there or write it out on the next page. We're basically gonna write out the, the momentum equations. Like that. Write the big picture. So. So that's the sort of general vector form of what it's going to look like. Let's go through each of these. And who needs, does anyone need a sheet? Raise your hand. Did you pass this back? Does anyone else need a sheet? You guys got it? Uh, okay, I'll need this one back though, because it's my solution. So. so the left hand side, um, should be zero, um, because of a couple things. Either V or W is zero, so anything with V or W, um, here, let's just write the very first one, so you get the idea. Rho du dt plus u du dx plus v du dy plus w du dz. Oh man. Is equal to negative dp dx plus rho d sub x plus mu. So that's why I gave you the equation sheet. So you, you shouldn't have to write that out. Um, but we just let's do it together the first time. So what do we know from the previous statements? We know that u is a function of y. We know v is equal to w is equal to 0. Um, and we know du dx uh, is equal to du dz. And those are all 0. Uh, d, this one's from conservation of mass. This is from infinite plates. And we know that anything involving time is zero. That's what we got just from the geometry of the problem, from the fact they're in, they're like you know bacteria between two pieces of bread, and steady state. Um, so that means that anything that's a function of z is just immediately going to be zero because things can't change in that direction. So and so basically, this is zero because of steady state. Um, this is zero because of du dx is zero. Now, if you have a product that's zero, of course, and any that's that's zero if any of the terms are zero. V and W are both zero. These are zero because of the infinite plates. Um, so all you have left is, if you're doing this right, you should just have left two terms. Maybe plus maybe one more term with gravity. And we said g was already in the y direction. Uh, g is equal to g y hat negative. All right. 
And you could actually cross it out in the equation sheet that I give you with the quiz because you only have to do this once um, for Cartesian. For Car Cartesian. So in the end, you should get you should get the following equation for x, y, and z. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to do abbreviations. All right. Does anyone have questions how we got those three? What we have now are differential equations. Before, it was called partial differential equations because originally u was a function of x, y, and z, but now u is only a function of y. So these are just differential equations. Does anyone want to go over how we got from the, this step to this step? Yeah. OK, this is a really good point. Um, First of all, sorry, I did this wrong. Um, this is a good point. Okay. U is in the, the velocity is in the x direction, but it only changes as a function of y. Um, so I had this wrong. So this one's zero, and this one's the one that remains. So the velocity is going to the right, but it's changing as a function of going up and down. It's changing as the distance between the breads. So you see there's a structure to this. These, so where are these, this is a, the linear momentum, the conservation of linear momentum. Um, and basically, it tells you you got some inertial terms, but because nothing's accelerating, that's all zero. And you basically got Pressure differences are balancing out um, shear stress. So physically, shear stress is due to the fact the walls are rigid and hard, and the fluid is, imagine it's peanut butter. There's some viscosity that wants to resist kind of flow. Um, last time we showed that tau xy is equal to mu du um, du dy, and this is basically the basically how much the shear stress is changing over a unit distance y. So that, that's basically physically where these terms come, come from. So this is pressure, and this is viscous stress. Yeah? Um, should it be plus rho d in the y direction? Okay, that's a good point. So I try to keep the notation that, um, so I keep the negative signs embedded in the vector. So I have plus, plus. But we already decided that g was negative g y hat. So that's where it came to be negative. Um, for the same reason, if you look at that equation sheet, they, they put pluses everywhere. But ultimately, it could change to a minus sign depending on the actual direction of gravity. So out of these three equations, so the whole goal of this thing is to actually figure out what the velocity profile is, how the velocity changes with the position. And the only equation that will actually help you do that is that first one. And that's very typical of these problems, that you have one of them that you can integrate twice, and the other ones just sort of hang around. Um, so, but let's integrate all of them and see what information they contain. OK, so we'll start with the last one. Um, zero is equal to negative dp dz. If you integrate that respect to z, you get p is equal to some constant plus a function of x and y. 
So this integrate integrate with respect to z. Remember, every time you integrate, you've got to decide what variable you're going to integrate. And it really only makes sense. You only make progress if you sort of get rid of that derivative. But anything that is not a function of z acts like a constant, like some crazy whatever function here. When you integrate with z, it's just going to disappear. So you know the pressure, the pressure field in general, p is a function of x, y, and z. Um, it's going to basically be something plus a function of x and y. So it's really not going to be changing with z very much. And that's what this says. p does not change with z. p does not change with z. All right, so that doesn't really um, help you very much. Let's do the, so that was the z hat. Let's do the y hat now. And the quiz, I don't think you need to do all these steps, but just for practice, this will tell you what information is contained in each of these independent equations. Remember, each of these are basically linear momentum in the x, y, and z direction. This tells you that conservation of linear momentum in the z direction, you know, the direction going towards you, doesn't tell you very much. OK, this next one, uh, let's just write over, z is actually dp dy minus rho g. Well, this might bring back memories from quiz two, because this is basically Pascal's law. It tells you how pressure varies hydrostatically. So you integrate this, you get p is equal to negative rho g y plus f of x. Um, where basically, here, here, you know, I go y increasingly negative value, then my pressure goes up. So this just says pressure varies hydrostatically. except for this function of x. And um, we'll see a couple of cases where, so there could be, as I said, depending on how the problem is, there could be different kinds of flow. There could be pressure-driven flow, like someone's actually like, sitting there sucking the peanut butter out. Then the pressure is going to be decreasing with x. Closer to your mouth, it's going to be really high in magnitude, and farther away, I'm going to get less and less influence. But otherwise, this is saying that you know between the breads, it's just going to be you know, higher pressure because that bottom peanut butter has got to support the weight of the top peanut butter. All right, so those are not super useful. Now, the one we really care about is this one. Um, so, just to write it on one side, d squared u dy squared is equal to 1 over u mu dp dx. So I wrote it like this because the whole goal of this problem is to figure out u as a function of y. I want to keep everything else, kind of like shove it and put under a constant on the right-hand side. Now, this may look intimidating, but you have to keep in mind that we've already shown that p is not, dp dx is not a function of, uh, of y. Just look at this equation. If I do take the derivative of dp dx, it basically um, is not a function, it's not a function of uh, uh, basically, it's going to have this term, but there's going to be no y dependence on this. So this is not a function of y because of what we showed uh, from the y hat momentum equation. Yeah. Why wouldn't that constant have uh, with respect to? Yeah. Oh, why is that not x comma z? Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, because this is, p does not change with z. So we already said that p looks like this, and so we kind of combine that information to go here. But you're right, in general, it would be like f of x of z, but because we've already said dp dz is zero, there's no way we could have anything left. It gets obliterated. So, so these are actually all just telling you what the pressure looks like, what the possibilities are. And instead of having some really complicated function, it's basically just the stacking of these two functions, hydrostatics and whatever we get from the draw. All right, so like I said, now we know that dp dx in particular is not a function of y. So I don't know what it is. It's going to be some crazy thing 
but it's not going to be it's not going to be a function of y. And that means everything here can be acted like treated like a constant. Okay. So when you just integrate this, um, well, let's uh, when you integrate this, um, so we integrate with respect to y. Do it twice, and use the constants a and b to get the general solution. I'll do it one at a time, just, just like I said, we do it slowly this first time. One over here. Yes. Y. Okay. So of course, integrate it once, you get a linear. So we call this the general solution. Four parallel plates. The ge so the geometry of the problem, the fact that it was infinite x and z, has set the solution. Um, we didn't say what the peanut, what the plates are made of. Um, <clears throat> we didn't say if it's pressure driven or gravity driven flow. And that's kind of the elegance of this, that I'll draw a couple different problems that you can use this general solution to solve. Um, it's quite applicable. Like this is actually going to be applicable for mudslides, um, all these different types of problems. That you have basically infinite directions in two, two directions, x and z. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah, x and z. And like, you, like I said, it's going to look like a parabola, right? u is a function of y squared plus this and plus this. So the whole goal is to get something you can draw. The problem is you can't draw it yet because you don't know what, know what A and B are. And that's where the, our old friends, the boundary conditions, come in. The boundary conditions um, will basically, you need two, every time you've got two constants, you're going to need two boundary conditions. For all the rectilinear problems, the boundary conditions are quite straightforward because they are associated with each of the two boundaries. Um, for cylindrical, um, you're going to have this extra one that we'll talk about. It's a little bit more, less intuitive. All right. So, so we have to get A and B using boundary conditions. And in this case, it's basically two plates separated by a distance 2h. Does anyone know the name of like one of the boundary conditions? Like what it's called in general? It's called no slip. That's the most, it's the most famous one. Um, Basically, it says on the top plate, the velocity of the fluid needs to match the velocity of the plate. Um, I teach this mini master um, on my book on animal movement, and there's a couple cases in nature and from really high tech materials, no slip condition doesn't hold anymore. Um, like a shark scales, if you've ever watched the, like the Olympics before, that these speedo fast skin suits that they broke like literally 12 world records wearing these suits. And a lot of people thought it was because they were changing the no slip boundary condition. Because imagine, and this is what they do for torpedoes. Um, I think the Russians might have invented this first and then the Americans copied it. But basically, if you take a torpedo, you send it to the water, you have skin, you have drag on the edges because the torpedo is solid. So the Russians decide, hey, let's coat the whole torpedo in a bubble. So they have the front of the torpedo leaking out air. And so, as the torpedo goes, the air is basically traveling backward, and the water doesn't feel the torpedo, it only feels the air, and so the drag is way, way, way less. And those torpedoes do it pretty fast. 
And Sharkskin was thought to have to violate the no-slip boundary condition. Um, but it turns out um, it's more complicated than that. And uh, the way that sh those Faskin suits work, work is they just like squeeze the swimmer into a thinner shape. And that just decreases their area as they go through the water. They're, I think they're illegal now. But all those world records have been broken. So um, that's somebody else. Somebody's, so they got a lot of challenges. But for most of this class, and like you can assume no slip is true, um, because it basically says if you're a molecule, you basically you can't just shear. You're going to get stuck on this. Um, so at y equals h, OK, so basically, um, the easiest way to do this is zero substitution. So at y equals h, we have u is equal to 0, and that's equal to dp dx over 2 mu h squared. We just substitute in for h. Uh, y equals negative h, um, the velocity is 0. If you substitute in and you look at the structure of these things, the easiest way to solve for b is to add them. Um, And if you subtract them, you get the other one. All right. So in terms of what the solution looks like, we got rid of the two um, unknown variables. So all that's, so basically, what does this look like? It looks like. U of y. Uh, okay, let's just box this. That's what we care about. Um, we got this. Y squared minus a squared. Uh, Like that. Okay. Um, so uh, you can tell that clearly fits this. At y equals h, this thing is going to be zero, and the slope, kind of like the slope of the parabola, is going to look like that. Um, and it's clearly highest magnitude at y equals zero. So the velocity profile, highest in the center and decreasing. And just make sure it gets to zero at the edges. So if you're basically like you're swimming through this peanut, if you're a bacteria in this peanut butter jelly sandwich, you really want to go in the center, um, center where the velocity is highest. Um, all right. So the various problems that in the book. They ask you to derive things besides the velocity field. One of the things they might ask you to derive are the volumetric flow rate. Which is a simple matter of just integration. The, the, we didn't have to integrate previously for all your conservation of linear momentum problems because we had always assumed that the velocity doesn't change across the profile. But here, it clearly does, so there's no way about it. You really do have to integrate. Um, so <clears throat> integral of u, um, and of course, this is infinite into the page, so it's going to be uh, basically, in this case, it's going to be a flow rate per unit length. Uh, flow rate per unit length, or you're going to assume dA is w into the board. 
So let's just assume that. It'll be easier. U, W, D, Y. This is D, A. Why don't you see if we can integrate that in your seeds? You'll have to do it at some point. Yeah. Uh, can you please repeat what the no slip condition physically says again? Oh, well, it says the velocity is zero at the boundaries. Um, so, because the boundaries are moving at zero velocity, the fluid has to move at zero velocity. So, it literally means like no slipping, no slipping by that thing. Imagine if you're like running between a narrow corridor and you had to brush up against a brick wall. You're probably not going to want to slip either because you're going to like tear up all your skin. That's what it, that's what it means. <clears throat> all right, so you should get dp dx over 2 mu y squared minus 8 squared dy. Negative 2 h cubed over 3 mu dp dx. Oh, times W. All right. So this is a good way place to check your answer. Does anyone think that negative sign is right, correct, or incorrect? And why is it there? Do we really have negative flow rate? Yeah, probably not. Probably don't have an ending for it. Um, so everything else is going to be positive. H is positive. Mu is positive. W is positive. The only way you could have a positive flow rate is if dp dx is negative. What does it mean for dp dx to be negative? It means that so dp dx physically is negative. Physically, it's how much pressure changes with distance down the sandwich. And now we're, we're basically saying the pressure decreases with x. So this, this, that's what this fixes. Pressure decreases with x. Pressure magnitude decreases with x. So that means if we said, let's just mark this tube x equals 0, we have x equals little l. And some people are doing course projects on this, like the race car course project, or if you have any kind of wind tunnel. You have basically, or I sit here and literally blow. Because of viscous losses, whatever pressure I put in is going to be less than the pressure I get out. That's because we have viscosity in this problem. And so you basically have P plus delta P here, and then here the, the P will just be pressure P. The P has decreased with X, dP dx is negative, and then that means the Q is positive. So the pressure gradient is the, well, basically P is higher here than here, so the gradient is actually up, and then basically gradient is in the negative direction, but the flow is in the positive direction. That's what it means. So we still have flow because we're going from P plus delta P to a pressure of P. Some people call that the pressure drop. Um, uh, but basically, if you have any kind of viscous losses, pressure is going to drop. And this tells you a couple of things physically that if I make, like if I have this be air, I'm going to get one flow rate. 
If I have something that's a thousand times more viscous than air, like water, I'm gonna have another flow rate. Now I'm gonna have something like tar or like glycerol is gonna be even lower. Um, <clears throat> that's what that's what this says. So anytime you see DPDX, think about <clears throat> that it's ba you're basically going to be losing pressure in the direction of the flow. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So it's, let's just write it for us. High pressure and low pressure. Um, <clears throat> let's put it this way. If DPDX were positive, it would be going from low to high. Like if you had your money flow as a function of time be positive, I'm going to be rich over here. But right now, I'm basically poor, pressure poor. All right. Um, some people might also ask the mean velocity. So mean velocity. Um, for example, um, so the mean velocity is going to be proportional to the flow rate. In this case, the mean velocity u, we'll call it with a bar, is basically the flow rate divided by the cross-sectional area. Um, in that case, you'll get h squared delta p over 3 u little l, where I've used the substitution of dpdx with p divided by l. <coughs> Um, the max velocity, u max, negative a squared over 2 mu dp dx. <coughs> the max velocity is three halves the mean velocity. So it's 50% higher than the mean velocity. Um, and that's about as interesting, that's about all the things I could really ask. Okay. So the big thing in this problem, we derived the following uh, governing equation. Um, so I'm going to uh, I'm going to confuse people. dp dx over 2 mu <coughs> y squared plus a y plus b. So again, this was the governing equation for parallel plates. or infinite parallel. So anytime you see parallel plate poem, if you really have no time, you can just like, actually it would be pretty hard to remember, remember that because of this constant. But you're gonna notice this following parabolic structure. So this, that equation works for the following problems. Um, what we just did was basically infinite parallel plates and we showed the flow look like this. That's, those are just called the parallel plate problem. It also works for um, this other problem that we can do briefly here, where you have a different boundary condition. But the top plate is moving at some speed u naught. Um, this has a special name because people actually use this to measure viscosity. So there's a large, I mean, basically, as soon as they decided the definition of viscosity, they had to figure a way to measure precisely. Um, the food industry has invented very, very precise ways. For example, yogurt, chocolate, melts in your mouth, on your hand, all that stuff is engineered to sort of make it taste, taste good. But they've got to basically translate physical objects into measuring the viscosity. And this is one of the devices they use. And it's called Kuwait flow, where you have the bottom plate fixed and you're dragging the top plate. And all the solutions are going to look like something that looks like a parabola. So here, it's going to look like something like this. Um, and that depends on how much you have an A and how much you have a B. Um, so that's Kuwait flow. Um, all right. There's, there's endless ways that you could um, be tested on this. Um, mudslides, I think there was one in Brazil that killed a whole bunch of people. Uh, there's still a big problem throughout the world because they happen so quickly. Um, but uh, mudslides, for example, I've got a fluid that's coming down. Um, it's also going to kind of look like this. Um, where here, I have the no slip boundary condition, u is equal to zero here. So I'll call this a mud slide. It could be mud, it could be snow. And the top boundary condition is going to be
zero shear stress. So it's a gravity driven flow in this case. So the top vector tends to be zero shear stress because air is not like a plate. It cannot support stresses. Um, if you also have a problem that you have wind blowing, like if you have wind blowing a thing, that could generate a shear stress, but in this case, it's zero. Um, I believe there's a problem in the book where you have two boundary conditions. So you've got basically, some people are doing this for course projects, stratified fluids, fluids composed of two different things. You've got a mu one and a mu two here, oil and water, let's say you're trying to make salad dressing. And you're either shearing the top plate or you're having some pressure here, you're gonna also get some, so this, let's say there's a high pressure. High pressure, you get, you get something like this. Sorry, they've got a beat. Gotta make this physically. Beat. Maybe it's like really like something like this. Where the profiles are gonna be determined by the two viscosities, just like here. And the boundary conditions here. Um, does anyone know what? I think I. Uh, okay, so the top ones you have no. So, how many boundary conditions do you need for this problem? Close. Yeah, you need four. And that's because each fluid doesn't see the other fluid, only they only see each other at the interface. So each fluid, you're going to have like a U1 and a U2, and each of those governing equations comes up with two conditions. So you're going to need four. So let's just count what those conditions would be. So you got, just tell me what, what, what would those four be? No slip on the edge. So you have no slip, U1 is equal to zero, U2 is equal to zero. What about the rest? Yeah. They're not be going at the same velocity. Yeah, that's one of them. It's called velocity matching. In other words, if you basically have a little probe, you basically cannot go from velocity matching is in some ways no slip. It's basically saying, if I have a little probe, I can't just go from y equal, u equals zero to u equals five meters per second. I've got to go continuously. In other words, you've got no slip between the fluids, and so they've got to be matched, but only at the boundary. So that's one of them velocity matching. What about the other one? Yeah, that's right. Do you know what that would be called? Yeah, it's, um, so it has to do with this is shear stress. So velocity matching, that says u1 equals to u2 at the boundary. And also, um, as Foster said, du1, dy, du2, dy. All right, it's a little bit more subtle than that. u1 is equal to mu. So what I've written there is the equations. If you remember, we did these stress deformation relations last time. But it says the shear stress. Remember, shear stress is units of force per unit area. But it's basically how much one fluid is shearing the other in terms of force per square meter. And what this is saying is that, so Father was not totally right. She thought the slopes had to match. But it's really the physical thing is actually the magnitude of the shear stress. And that magnitude is modulated by this viscosity mu1. Like you could have a very slow uh, velocity gradient, but if you've got a thing that's made out of molasses, it's going to have a really high shear stress. So, so these two have to these two have to match. Yeah. Can you move the top camera. Oh yeah. So those two have to match. Um, and I think I assigned one of those for homework. Um, but that's why, for some reason, when I took this class, I was like, what, 20? I took this class around your age, like a long time ago. I'm like 41 now. And I thought, it's pretty cool. You can go from just like parallel plates, and you can like solve like all these problems with that same governing equation. Like it's really, really like useful. So, okay, so that's rectilinear coordinates. You shouldn't have any problem with doing, doing it. In fact, I don't, I don't think I'm gonna do it anymore on rectilinear. And, that's the good news about rectilinear. It really doesn't change very much 
Um, the only thing that will change is the boundary conditions. But the structure, because all these problems have shared the same thing, that they're both infinite in the x and z directions. Infinite in this direction and towards you. But otherwise, you're just adding different fluids and doing different stuff. And that's changing the number of boundary conditions. But otherwise, the basic structure remains the same. OK. Um, so hopefully you understand like the basic way we do these problems. Now, cylindrical coordinates, I'm going to warn you, there's like basically two different kinds of problems for that. Um, one of them is going to be very similar to this. And let's just talk about that now, because it's basically an extension of what we're doing. So um, and if you talk to biologists, um, and I mean, even like civil engineers, the parallel plate problem is not super useful because we generally don't have like infinite plates. But tubes, um, we've been using them for a long time because they reduce the amount of material that you contain a fluid. So it's so useful that they don't even, like that one was just called, well, I call it peanut butter jelly sandwich flow. Um, this one actually has a name because they studied this first. Uh, Hagen, sounds like some German person, Hagen. Um, and plus a French person. Hagen plus a flow. Um, so tube of radius r. All right. All right, I know it's getting a little small, but basically the whole thing about cylindrical coordinates, instead of using x, x, y, and z, we're going to be using u as a function of, so we're going to call it u, r, u, theta, u, z. And each of these are going to be a function of r, theta, and z, and time. So basically, analogous to the peanut butter problem, how far are you away from the bread? where you are north, east, west, and south, and how far you are down the tube. Okay. Um, and I'll tell you the answer right away that, um, as we'll show, it's going to basically look like the same thing. You're going to basically have, uh, this is not good. Uh, I'm going to try, I'm trying to draw like a 3D parabola that's like, oh no. Yeah, that's what it looks like, where it's like, a, Fastest in the center, fast at r equals zero, and slowest as you go out. All right. Um, we're going to have to stop in five minutes to let the group present side walls. So, flow is parallel to side walls. You have ur, the radial component of velocity being zero, and u theta being zero. The only thing that we care about is uz. Conservation of mass looks a little more complicated. So on your equation sheet, I've given you two versions of the conservation of mass. One of them, so with rho zero, basically rho goes away. One of them is the top one, that's the one we just used. The next one's the bottom one. And it's got one over r's, so you've got to be careful. Um, and this says, this, if you substitute in these two assumptions, you show that, just like we had before, the velocity, the velocity in the z direction does not change with the distance down the tube. All right. We do use a kind of a condition that's different from infinite, and that's this idea of axisymmetry. That in the absence of gravitational forces, um, In the absence of uh, gravitational forces, u shouldn't be changing with theta, because I could spin the tube, it doesn't really matter. Um, 
and it shouldn't be changing with time because it's steady. So just like we had last time, this is our single variable that we're trying to solve for. The, the z velocity as a function of distance from the center. That's what that means. Sorry. All right. I'm going to do the case with no gravity. Um, Okay, so the, the Navier-Stokes equations, we've done this before. Um, you're going to get the following. So ultimately, the key reason why the cylindrical coordinates are a little more complicated are because the way, as you saw from conservation mass, when you take one del, one divergence, you have a 1 over r. And that just makes things worse when you have a second del, when you have del squared. They call that del policy. Sorry. I'm If you ever want to show people how make people scared about fluid mechanics, you just probably want to do this math like in front of them, like randomly, because I think it, it does scare people. Um, but ultimately, this is embedded in the structure of those equations. Like, um, I think the one I've written here is might be no, I guess it's got a pretty similar form. The book has a slightly some some people like take the derivatives even more to simplify. But uh, my motto is I think you should just take the derivatives at the end. You should leave the brackets and the structure the way it is until you, can wait, until you can't wait any longer. Um, so in this case, um, OK, we are leaving gravity here. So basically, if you've got gravity going downward, the radial component is gravity is negative g sine theta. g theta is equal to negative g cosine theta. Then so that makes g is equal to g y hat, and that's equal to negative g cosine theta theta hat minus g sine theta r hat. So if I've just got something up here in the y, it's got some theta and some r, and the amount of theta and the amount of r will depend on what the angle is. Like if I'm in zero, like twelve o'clock, three o'clock, whatever, it's going to change how much gravity is. All right. So, like we did before, you integrate with respect to R. R sine theta plus f of z. Physically, R sine theta is equal to the distance y. Um, again, this is hydrostatic pressure. So this is basically very similar to what we had before. Um, and also, this says it says the z component of pressure is independent of r and theta. Um, but the hardest equation is unfortunately the one that you have to solve. Um, so we write we write that like this. One over mu dp dz. You should practice integrating this at home. If you do, it 
Because of the, the nature of the del squared, instead of getting a linear plus a constant, you have a log. The natural log that arises in fluid mechanics. Um, so I'm going to start finishing up. Hey, uh, the group who wants to present, um, if you guys want to start setting up your stuff, um, if you need to, I think maybe we need to share screens on this thing. When you uh, start coming up to the front. Okay, so that log. Okay, so the boundary condition, you can't use the same old one as before. Um, usually just the new one called finiteness. So u sub z is finite at r equals zero. Because that's a log r. If a log, log of r, you guys want to take the computer? Uh, name desktop. You want to just use my account? Or you can log on to your account, whatever easier. Lujin's already on, so you probably have to use this one. Um, so the problem with a log r is basically when r equals zero, it blows up. That's never good. Um, so we just require a to be finite. So u z to be finite um, at r equals zero. And that means a is equal to zero because if some of you didn't remember, log of zero is negative infinity. Um, no slip in this case at r is equal to capital R. We have u z equals zero. That means b is equal to negative one over four mu. dp dz capital R squared. So our final answer is very similar in form. Hi, Daniel. Okay. All right, let's see. All right, we have six minutes, so like three minutes for questions, three minutes for the presentation. Um, so you guys, we're just going to play this, and then you're going to answer questions live. All right. Uh, oh, wait, I need to share screens with blue jeans. Oh, did you already share screens?